Thanks, Tony. That was an awesome introduction. Hey, everybody, this is Lance Gill, and I want to say thanks again to K-Motion for being leaders in, in our world of movement, science, quantifying movement, and honestly giving us a better ability to work with our clients and provide results. That's our job as medical practitioners, even as fitness and golf practitioners. Our job is to help our clients get better. And we at TPI, we at LG Performance are very, very get these improvements with our players. And oftentimes those improvements that we're searching for are in fact, I want to play in less pain. And that's kind of where over the last five to six years we've been doing a lot of work with K-Motion to help quantify, understand, train, and deliver better results to our clients who are, who are in fact experiencing pain. So as a medical professional, even as a fitness professional, building successful rehab programs is a part of our job. You may have a golfer who's 90% healthy but has just a little bit of an ache or pain somewhere here or there. It's our job to help golfers play without pain or to mitigate or reduce pain as much as we can because we know the simple fact that the number one reason people stop playing golf is it hurts. It takes them off the course and that's a negative for everybody in the industry. So today we just want to take a look at how we're building successful programs, um, rehab programs, using the K-Motion technology uh, to both assess, quantify, as well as deliver uh, feedback to our athletes so that they can help themselves get to that next level. Now I want everyone to keep in mind that the main purpose of what we're doing here is to help our golfers reach their goals. As medical professionals, we often have our norms from anatomy and physiology, all the medical norms based on science, those are great, but if they don't meet or coincide with the client's goals, then it doesn't matter. So the, I'm going to operate this whole webinar under the premise that our client has come to us and said, geez, this really hurts, or I need to ha get help in this area. And from there, we're going to build everything that we do around their goals. And if we do that, and we help our clients achieve their goals, they have no reason to say no to you into the future. And that, from a financial perspective, is very advantageous. All right, so what we're going to start talking about here is just a little bit of an outline for today's presentation. All right, the, the objectives of today are to show and demonstrate how we're using K-Motion at TPI and at LGP to help our clients grow within the framework of injury prevention. I want to give you a couple applications or examples so you can see real life of how we're doing that. And then at the end, Tony and the guys are going to be able to deliver you some, some ideas and some examples of how this can be used in a business setting. I'll serve as maybe the medical expert, if you will. Some people would argue with that. Um, and then the guys will show you a little bit about how you can implement this into your business. So understanding both the examples, the practical, as well as the financial, that's what we're going to cover today. So what I think is important so getting started here is demystifying. I like that word, so I threw it in there, demystifying data in golf rehab. For too long, people have hurt and we focus just on the injury site. And, you know, for most part, the medical field is really good at fixing injuries. But the injury itself is not the whole problem. All right. We need to have a systematic approach uh, or a roadmap, if you will, to how, how to locate the source of the issue. The source can sometimes be the body, and sometimes it can be the golf swing or the activity that we're, our athletes are engaging in. And it can be both combined, to be honest with you. So having a repeatable roadmap that we can use to both assess, validate, and treat is very, very important for us in our clinical setting. We work off a structure, and any time a new piece of technology is input into that structure, it kind of is like a nuclear bomb. It, it explodes our process, our, our go-to rhythm, if you will. 
But understanding how to use the technology and implement it into that repeatable roadmap, I think has been a valuable asset for our work at TPI and LGP with our clients to get them better. Understanding the data is very, very important. Sometimes we get data overload and with all the new technology that's coming, it's very easy to get caught in the trap of, holy cow, what do I do? This is so much information. Not to mention, from the client's perspective, if they're seeing all this, their head will literally explode. So we have to understand how to look and quantify the data um, for the human body and the golf swing and then correlate it together. In a nutshell, boil it down to the simple common denominator or the KISS methodology is keep it simple, stupid. All right, then the last thing is have tools to rebuild or build. I should have said rebuild because we're dealing with an athlete that's kind of broken down. So we, we have to be good at assessing and validating what we're assessing and then implementing strategies to overcome that. We can implement strategies with ourselves as experts in the medical field from all the tools in our tool belt. The problem is many times the athlete doesn't uh, retain that information when they're out on their own in the, in the big open world. So we have to be able to implement better strategies within our clinics, within our settings to help the athlete retain the information, go out and actually use the new programs that we're trying to put in place via motor or physical or what have you. So the objectives here is to create that repeatable roadmap get very familiar with the data, and then utilize our tools more effectively so we can rebuild our athlete. So the approach is going to be, we're dealing with the body and the golf swing. You can see them here. Now, the body and the golf swing traditionally have different ways of evaluating them. 2D video, physical assessments, um, and they're oftentimes done in different silos, two different uh, venues. The problem with that is many of our athletes come to us for, hey, I want to get better at golf. I want this golf uh, stuff to stop hurting me. What can we do? I'm not a believer of separating the two. I think what we have to do, and this is my opinion, is always keep the golfer within the context of the golf world. They're there for golf. They want to play golf, but they're hurting. So don't remove them totally from the world of golf. Always allow them to see. Right, the, the carrot, if you will, or the reason why they're there, which is golf. So I like to evaluate the body and the swing together and see um, what is happening in both worlds because you're going to find that the two worlds overlap a majority of the time and they're not isolated incidents. So medical professionals, one of the things that I think we can do a better job of is relating everything back to the world of golf and back to why they're there to see us because of back pain, hip pain, what have you, creating more speed and using a data-driven approach to it all. Something that has worked for us very, very well over the last 20 years with our golfers is not guessing. I have found that kinematic sequence and the data provided by three-dimensional analysis has been a cheat sheet for me for such a long time. I really don't have to guess. So if a client is coming to me for X and I find that their body is doing X, Y, and Z as it relates to their goal of improving X, it's a simple fix. I don't have to guess. Too many people get frayed and put off by all the numbers that you're, you're seeing by these new technologies. But if you know what you're looking at and what you're looking for, it can make it a lot easier. So that's going to be our approach today. And to make it real simple, um, the data that we're going to collect is going to be in the fields of, you know, evaluation, biofeedback, and then validating and reporting whether or not our implementation or our strategy or our therapy is providing results. Because you can use this technology for all three. It's a seamless uh, juncture from the initial assessment to the post-validation of what we do, and then moving onwards and forwards, reassessments going forward. We've done this for a long time at Titleist, and it's just starting to get to the, the practitioners out in the field right now that this is a very easy and simplistic uh, methodology to looking at our clients. I don't know if it was a bell curve effect, we were just on the front end of it, or Therapists get so caught up in their, their normal routine that I talked about earlier 
but there is a different way to do it and it is quantifiable, it's validated and very reliable. All right, so today what I want to look at is basically two conditions. All right, so we'll take the number one condition, lower back pain. Um, I often see clients uh, come in with both of these conditions. I want more speed and I'm hurting in my lower back. So you're going to see these two blend together. And that's kind of why I chose them because they're going to be two of your most common um, requests or goals that clients come to see you, especially in the rehab or medical world. Lower back pain being the number one and then increasing speed. If you get into the, the tertiary goals, I don't know what four is, but I'll say the quadrary goals is going to be more consistency and playing golf longer. All right, so those are the top four goals I typically see people. So we'll go after the, the top two here. Playing, and just a little fact, I from the last time I checked the data, about 70% of golfers worldwide have played with some sort of back issue at some point in their career. Doesn't mean it's happening all the time, but 70% of golfers worldwide have complained of a back pain at some point in time. That's a significant report, and like I said, if we don't do something about that, that gives the opportunity for this golfer to leave the game because they can't play to the level they want. It hurts too much. And when that enjoyment goes down, they stop spending money. That's a problem. All right. So those are the two conditions we're going to look at. And what, what I'm interested in is connecting the dots in both of those conditions. The first one being back pain. So taking the client on a journey using data to deliver us better results on our assessment, um, the golf swing, and then implementations of strategies to fix that. So you can see here, it, what we're going to look at is for lower back pain, I want to I start off by showing three common screens, physical screens that we're going to do that help us understand a little bit about lower back pain from an analytical standpoint, from a data-driven standpoint. And then how those correlate into the golf swing. So are we going to see some of the same things that we see in the physical screen in the golf swing? We call that the body swing connection at Titleist. And, and that's an important concept. The other thing that you'll see is that oftentimes um, the body part that we're going to assess is not, in fact, the same as the body part that is being complained of. So in this case, lower back pain is the issue. That doesn't necessarily mean we're going to look at the lower back. Now, most of our medical professionals are pretty savvy on this, but if there's fitness and golf professionals joining us, I really want to drive that point home because it'll affect your, your teaching and your training as well. Don't always look at the source of the client's dysfunction. So if they come to you and say, my lower back hurts, well, maybe it's the hips, maybe it's the ankles, maybe it's the torso that's causing the problem. It could be the neck. So we have to look outside the box of exactly what the client is complaining of to see potentially if that's where the answer lies. So that's what we're going to be looking at into the, into the day here. And so very simple stuff that you're very familiar with, the pelvic tilt test here, being able to quantify how much range of motion that the pelvis is um, going through, what position it starts at. But more importantly for our, is what the heck the opposite part of the body is. Now the pelvic tilt test focuses on the pelvis, but I don't want to just look at the pelvis. I always want to look at different parts of the body to see if they're compensating, if they're helping out when they shouldn't. All right, and you can see here, um, Connor is doing the pelvic tilt test, but as you can see with the K-motion, it's, it's altering his upper body posture. So you can infer that the lack of ability to perform the pelvic tilt test, both anterior and posterior, will in fact have a subsequent effect in his golf swing. And in Connor's case, you'll, you'll notice when he is arching his back, there's flattening, when he arches his back, his upper body stands up. Now we know that at the top of the back swing, many of our golfers go through a momentary anterior tilt or arching of the spine, at that point in time, it's creating a stretch reflex. This is a power source. This, this pelvic tilt test is a very important test for power. Connor here is, um, is going through this and losing his posture into an, a lumbar extended position. 
So if we see that in his golf swing, it's not going to surprise me. We also know that if you try to rotate your spine on excessive extension, those facet joints are going to start to smash against each other. And over time, they start talking back, aka pain. So that's an important concept we're going to look at. The next one we're going to look at here is seated trunk rotation. I'm interested in how the trunk rotates. M many of us were educated and taught by me that seated trunk rotation is a quantity test. Well, in fact, it is. The anatomical norms for this are about 45 degrees each way. And what we're looking for is does the client have the ability to rotate 45 degrees? So many clinicians, based off of my instruction or others' instruction, solely look for 45 degrees. Well, I'd like to turn the magnifying glass up just a touch, and using this technology, we're able to look at different parameters of the seated trunk rotation, such as what is the pelvis doing, all right? What is the side bend of the body doing? Are you changing your forward and backward bend during the seated trunk rotation? All of those parameters are going to affect your golf swing. So we'll get into some of those details. And then the third and final test we're going to look at here is lower quarter rotation. Lower quarter rotation is the opposite of seated trunk. It's the quantity test for the lower body, and that includes the hip, the tibial plateau, as well as the ankle. Now, a lot of times when people can't rotate those three sections to the appropriate anatomical norms, they're going to compensate and add other body movements to, to get there. Now, Again, the quantity is important. How you get to the quantity is very important. So again, that magnifying glass, I'm going to turn it up. We're going to look at different elements such as pelvic bend and pelvic side bend. Those two parameters are very, very important when assessing the lower quarter rotation test. And frankly, if you're not using technology, you can often miss them. It's very hard to see a quantifiable change in somebody's pelvis with the naked eye. It's very hard to tell if the pelvic side bend is changing during a lower quarter rotation with the naked eye. Having modern day technology with us allows us to not rely solely on our eye and get results that can be validated and oftentimes reimbursed. And that's a big deal for us. And then the last thing I want to do is talk a little bit about the golf swing. What are we seeing in the golf swing and how does that relate to ultimately the golfer's ability to produce uh, power, but mo more importantly, to prevent injury. So that's our connecting the dots, is we get a client comes in, ow, my back hurts, okay? We're very good at screening the client. We're getting better at finding the source of dysfunction. I still think we need to look more outside the actual pain site and get into the etiology or the source of the, um, the pain, I think that was the right word I used there. Somebody will correct me if it wasn't. All right, and then basically correlate it to the, the activity that the golfer is interested in. Now, I just gave the answer, the golfer is interested in golf. Many times as medical practitioners, we go, well, your, your lower back pain is stemming from a thoracic spine mobility issue to the right, so your T5 to T11 is not rotating, so we're going to manually adjust your rib cage at uh, rib number seven. And the golfer's like, oh, I don't know what's going on. That's great. Now, at the end of the day, we do all those manipulations. We get the thoracic spine rotating. We reassess with our goniometer, and we're like, oh, you've gone from 32 degrees uh, to 46 degrees, and the golfer is like, oh, great, that's great, I'm, I guess that's an improvement, but they're left not understanding what that means for their gain. If you can take this last step on the right of correlating it to the golf swing and showing them a quantifiable result, explaining how it affects the golf swing, you're going to see a better retention or buy-in from your client and a much, much, much happier and well-rounded golfer. Our golfers come to us to solve the issue for the game they love, not to solve the pain. All right? We talk about this a lot is we're, we're in effect, tying an emotional response to the, the reason why they're there to see you. We as medical professionals think it's there. They come to see us because they're pain. That is just the motivator for them to get into their sport. So look past the pain, look why they're there. If you can attach emotional outcomes to 
the pain modulation that you are working on, you're going to get better results as compared to just focusing on pain modulation, all right? Because there's not as long of a retention in the athlete. Retention being, hey, this practitioner was awesome. They are great. I always tell my medical professionals all around the world, we are awesome at fixing problems, but we're not awesome at retaining clients because invariably two months after somebody comes to us for physical therapy or chiropractic services, they don't remember our names. Even though we got them out of the most excruciating pain that they've ever been in, they forget who we are because we do not tie an emotional response to the reason why they're there and the reason isn't solely pain. It's pain to get into the game of golf in a much more happy environment. So I hope that's clear and concise. So attach the emotional response. We can talk more about that later. Um, if we do that, we're probably going to get a little bit better response out of our athletes. So let's start test by test. Here's the pelvic tilt test. And what we're going to do here is just look at the client's ability to tilt their pelvis. Now, I got Connor here going through the pelvic tilt test, and you'll notice I don't have any pelvic numbers set up on the graph. And I did this on purpose because I'm not interested in quantifying the pelvis all the time. You may do so if you wish, but I'm interested more in what is happening with the upper body. So you can see he starts at about 40 degrees of bend, and during the anterior tilt portion, he goes all the way up to the 20s, low 20s. So he, he goes from a 40-degree flex to a 20-degree flex. He extends 20 degrees via pelvic anterior tilt, which tells me he is using the lumbar spine predominantly to go through that motion. That is not what we want to see, and sometimes those are very hard to quantify with our naked eye. Now, in this case, you can see it. But I find when the, when the numbers are between 5 degrees and 10 degrees, it can get a little dicey because our eye isn't trained to see that. And, and it cannot reliably write the numbers of extension down on a piece of paper for pre-test to post-test. There's no way to be reliable and valid by doing that. But when we have the sensors on, the suit on, it's a systematic approach to getting those pieces of data so that on test one, we saw that Connor went from 40 degrees of forward flexion to 20 degrees of flexion when he anterior tilted. If by the end of session one, we can see a reduction of 50% of that, and he goes from 40 to 30, we can quantify and validate that our strategy is, in fact, providing good results. This is one of the ways that we're using motion technology to assess our athletes. And it goes back to the point, when you're doing a test, where it's always going to be a primary, and oftentimes there's a secondary or tertiary objective of the test. Let's not forget those secondary and tertiary objectives and, and just hone right in on that pelvis. Of course, I don't want to neglect the pelvis. I'll oftentimes put the numbers up to get a quantity measurement because I do want to see quantity, even though we just teach quality of motion. But I do want to take a look at those secondary pieces of data as well. So when doing the pelvic tilt test, I'd like you to open your eyes up a little bit more into those ballparks. Now, let's take the next test, the seated trunk rotation test. And there's a lot of stuff going on on the screen here. And one of the things we're going to look for is um, how far can you rotate your body? So upper right corner, you can see there we have some norms, 45 to 65 degrees. It, depending on if they're a female, a male, you'll see it's slightly different norms. But the average anatomical norms, if you take a compilation of all the research is in the 45 degree range, both right and left. When we look at our male tour pros, we're seeing anywhere between 50 to 56 degrees of range of motion right and left. So it's slightly higher than anatomical norms. Our LPGA numbers tend to be between 55 and 62, 63. So they're a little bit on the higher end and definitely on the higher end compared to anatomical norms. During this test, what we're going to do is solely look at the anatomical norm. So I'm going to use our baseline number of 45. But at the same time, I'm going to look at a bunch of different parameters, such as pelvic rotation, pelvic side bend, all right, upper body side bend, because I want to know how people are cheating, if you will, or compensating 
to get to those 45 degree numbers. So you're going to see here when, when Connor goes into his rotation patterns, all right, he's getting to that uh, 45, 50 degree norm. That's to the right. Here's to the left. Oh, good. He passes the test. All right. That's what the naked eye sees. But take a look at his pelvis. Now, as he rotates, his pelvis is actually turning up to 10 degrees both directions. That is hard to see with the naked eye. So if, if my man here gets to 50 degrees of torso rotation, but his pelvis is turning 10 degrees, it's effectively a 40 degree thoracic spine rotation, which is five degrees short of norm. That is a clinical finding that I think is very important, and it relates directly to back pain. More of our rotation, again, should come from our thoracic spine due to the inherent engineering structure of the T-spine versus the lumbar spine. The facet joints of the lumbar spine are oriented in a way that doesn't allow for rotation per segment as compared to the facet joints of the thoracic spine. So yes, in fact, our lower back pain can often be derived from a lack of mobility in the thoracic spine. And here with our athlete, we see that when he rotates, he is not getting the range of motion because that pelvis is moving also. All right. Now, I'm also looking at upper body side bend. In this thoracic spine, uh, seated trunk rotation test, sorry, I would like to see his shoulders rotate very flat and uniform. But at the end range of motion, you'll see that he's adding a little bit of side bend when he turns to the right. Left was really good. And we're looking at the lower right number. Boom. That number goes to minus seven. So he's adding a little bit of spine bend to compensate for a limitation in his thoracic rotation. There will be elements of side bend in the golf swing, but I don't want him having the need to excessively side bend to accommodate for a lack of um, thoracic rotation. So these are going to be important avenues to look at as well. One of the other things that we see occasionally is the pelvis changes position. Now, in this case, he's going upwards of two degrees of pelvic change. I would say anything over two is going to be something that concerns me. I'm not too concerned in, in Connor's case because it doesn't go above two. Plus or minus two is a very tight tolerance on these machines. The naked eye can't pick it up, and that tells me he's keeping a relatively stable lateral base of his pelvis, so his left hip's not going up or down. But you will see people get into higher positions, and trust me, when you do, it, it sticks out. So this seated trunk rotation, this is a very simplistic way of looking at it and getting more data for the test we're looking at. The primary goal, again, thoracic rotation. Secondary goal, how much pelvic rotation is occurring. Tertiary, how much side bend of the upper body is occurring. These are all things that I see on a daily basis. All right. And then the last test we're going to look at here for lower back pain is lower quarter rotation. Lower quarter rotation is a compilation of hip range of motion, knee tibial range of motion, and ankle range of motion. So if, if you're looking at roughly 40 degrees of hip rotation, both internal and external, and 15 of tibial plateau, and then 5 of ankle, there you have a 60 degree measurement. So on the ground, traditionally, we have a 60-degree marker. It can be a 6-iron or some sort of grid you put on the ground to measure that 60. The problem is your eye has to look across the frontal plane of the pelvis. So connor has got his hands on his ASIS here. And imagine a line drawn through the ASIS on both sides, extending both right and left to infinite. All right? It's like you put on a pair of underwear. You know with an arrow sticking through. And we used to put those hats on when we were kids with an arrow sticking through. It looked like it was coming through your head. Well, think of that with his underwear. The problem with that is when you rotate, we are asking our practitioners to look at a, a, a virtual line through the ASIS extended out infinitely and compare it to the line on the ground. And there can be so much margin for error that too many people are passing this test in my opinion. So using motion capture technology, we're able to get to the bottom line faster and understand what is happening without guessing. I think this is the number one messed up test that we do from a clinician standpoint. And this is 
very, very valuable, and I'm so glad we have this technology so we don't have to guess. What we're going to look at during the test is the top left here, the pelvis turn, and then we're going to subsequently look at side bends and um, forward bend and backward bend of the pelvis. So our number that we're looking for is 60 degrees. Now when Connor rotates externally, he gets to 63. Internally, he gets to about 49, 50 degrees. But you'll notice when he turns to the right, internal, his backswing, he's also adding a pelvic bend. It starts at 15, gets into that 20 range, and then his side bend goes. So what he feels is a limitation or reaches the end range of motion on his lower body. So his pelvis changes position, the pelvic side bend changes position, and frankly, I could even put on the torso numbers here to dictate what his upper body is doing from a extension flexion perspective or side bend perspective. I'm trying to keep it simple in this demonstration and just use the pelvis numbers, but all of these have proven to be a compensation for his internal rotation on his trail hip. Now, if we have internal rotation on the, the lead leg, or sorry, trail leg into his backswing, a lot of times that translates upwards. The lower back says, oh, you can't rotate far enough in your backswing. Let me help out. And I'll go back to our point. The lower back wasn't designed to rotate, but we're asking it to rotate regardless. All right. So there's our assessments under motion capture technology. Pelvic tilt, seated trunk, lower quarter. In the golf swing, we're going to take a look at Connor's swing and just go over some basic parameters on what he is doing in that golf swing to see if we can find anything. All right, so let's take a look at his golf swing. So on the left here, we have a frontal view. This is oftentimes going to show us a lot of the information that we want to see from a why is this lower back pain happening. Uh, a couple lines I like to do, put a line right up his right leg or trail leg. I don't want to see him go past that line. So good thing here in Connor's swing, he, he doesn't have a significant amount of sway from a video perspective. The second thing we're going to look at is what we call reverse spine. So really from the center of the head to the center of the pelvis uh, here, oh, he looks like he's standing straight up. Now, this is oftentimes where we see our athletes. If, if you look at most of our tour pros with an iron here, they'll probably be in that you know slightly flexed position. So they'll have an appearance of tilting away from the target, which is represented by the green line. Oftentimes, our extreme um, reverse spines are seen in a slightly negative tilted posture, tilted away from are toward the target here, which is indicated by the blue line. Connor's in that middle zone. We don't really know if he's either flexed or extended. We can't tell via 2D video. Remember, two-dimensional video compresses the three dimensions we live in into two, and it provides no data on it. So on video, this could look like he's not reverse spining. We'll have to go to the 3D data to find out. Now, the second thing I look at is pelvic bend. So we talked about when you're rotating, we really don't want to see the pelvis change position too much. And as Connor rotates into his backswing, all right, we'll see that he maintains that pelvic tilt, maybe just a little bit more arch at the top of his backswing. If you look at a, a heat map, if you will, of all the professionals that we've worked with, a predominance of tour players in their backswing actually reduce their anterior tilt by one to four degrees from the setup position to the top of the backswing. Connor has actually increased it via video evidence. All right, We can't quantify and we can't tell you what it is, but he's going into that arch back position. Now, if you remember from his, his original pelvic tilt video, when he anterior tilts, he tends to um, stand up with his upper body. And you can see as he goes up into the top of his backswing, he slightly extends his spine. Right off the initial outset of his swing, his spine goes backwards and up. This is not a major, major issue. 
he maintains his posture pretty good, but he has the tendency to go up. Now, can you play golf like this? Absolutely, 100%. If you can go up, then he's going to have to try to initially compensate by going down to get into that impact position that he likes, and there you see him go down. All he's doing is adding moving parts to his golf swing. From a consistency standpoint, extra moving parts make it just slightly harder to be consistent. Again, I don't care if he goes up or down from a golf swing perspective. There's a lot of guys out there, a lot of girls that have made money doing it. What I do care is if he's going up using his lumbar spine and he's complaining about lower back pain, now it's a red flag for me because how many golf swings is this man taking in a week? The load on his lumbar spine is going to drastically increase the more swings he takes and that's going to jeopardize how much um, longevity he's going to have in our game. All right, so we're going to go back now to our our PowerPoint and we're going to talk a little bit about how this could be affecting him from a 3D and look at more of the what's happening on 3D from his movement standpoint. Okay, so we talked golf swing and here's 3D. This is Connor's golf swing. So a couple of the things I'm going to look at is the side bend of his pelvis. Now, the blue line on the top graph is going to represent left hip high or right hip high at any given point in the swing. Most of our norms you'll see at the set setup, at the beginning of the swing, the pelvis is going to be neutral to slightly lead hip high. We'll see with a driver between two and four degrees, iron maybe one to three degrees, that left hip for a right-handed golfer is going to be slightly high. Now, as you migrate into the backswing, we oftentimes see that change. The trail hip is going to go into a slightly more elevated position or a negative number. We really don't see too many of our golf professionals, the best ball strikers on the world, get more than 10 degrees high with their trail hip at the top of their swing. If you think about it, if it gets excessively high, the platform for your upper body starts to tip left which is the appearance of reverse spine. So in Connor's case, he gets to the top of the swing and he's minus 14 and a half degrees of uh, trail hip high. That is on the excessive end of things for what we see on our tour players. So now we can quantify that when he rotates, he's adding a little bit of pelvic side bend to it. Just same thing we saw in his lower quarter rotation test. Now the second thing we're going to look at is that upper body bend. Now on video, it looked like he was very, very vertical, upright. So you, some would say he has zero degrees of either forward bend or backward bend. But again, video can be misleading. Um, we're going to take a look at the green line on the bottom graph. The green line represents his um, amount of forward bend or backward bend at any point in the swing. So you can see he starts at 35.4 degrees of flexion with his torso at setup. Now for a six iron that he was hitting, he's pretty much on the low end of normal. Be that as it may, sometimes people are in and out of those ranges depending on swing styles. I get it. Um, we're just providing you with some baseline norms. But as he rotates to the top of the swing, look what happens. He's now in minus 13 degrees. Oh, uh, excuse me, Lance. It says 12.9. Oh, correct, correct. I rounded up. My bad. So he's minus 12.9 degrees of forward bend. So that means he's 13 degrees extended at the top. Our video looked like it was going to read zero. That's why video is misleading. So oftentimes that analysis tool on video, I, I take with a grain of salt and I really don't get my numbers until I look at that right there. Now, if I look at averages on um, our pros, you'll see that 10 to 14 degrees is what we see on a lot of our pros. I, you know, I, I, I will get numbers in that ballpark. That's with an iron. With a driver, it's going to be a little bit more vertical, but I don't want to see negative numbers. Let's just keep it at that. I don't want to see negative numbers. That tells me you're definitely going into upper body extension at the top of your swing. So now we have a correlation. The body can't rotate without pelvic tilt, without pelvic side bend, without upper body extending. We saw that in our physical screens. Now we're seeing it in our 3D motion capture. That's a validation. Now we have a tie-in. So you have that marriage of why the golfer's here, golf pain, why the golfer's really here to play golf. You have that marriage and you've tied in that emotional construct. 
So what do we do? Well, let's go right back to our parameters that we're trying to control. We're trying to get thoracic rotation, pure thoracic rotation, and control pelvic side bend. So we will once again go to our technology to actually implement movement strategies within and give the athlete a construct of how to do it, not just achieve 45 degrees, but to achieve 45 degrees without other body parts moving. Frankly, they don't know they're moving. All right, and when we give them a quantifiable way to see it, visualize it, they can translate those into feel. And the beautiful thing is you're not going to hear it on this video just for sound purposes, but we can add the auditory component to it. So when you get in these nice norms and your body positions are where, where we want them, and by the way, you set the variables. It's not just a pre-programmed set. All right, they get an auditory. So they have auditory feedback, visual feedback. You can add tactile feedback, and they're getting it regardless. So all three learning zones are covered. Here we go with the torso rotation test. My bad, we do have the audio. Very nice. You can see as Connor rotates, he gets into that zone, and it gives him a nice tone to say, okay, you're there. He is also looking at a computer screen so he can get the feedback visually as well with his body. And this, what we're trying to do on this test, is maintain pelvic neutral. When he did this test before, his back was arching as he rotated at end range. So you'll be able to see this bend number in the bottom left maintain relative same position. All right. This tells us as you rotate the upper body, you do not lose your pelvic control. And that's what I'm looking for in the golf swing. All right. And then we go to the quantity parameter. Can you rotate your torso to 45 degrees without losing control? Whereas before we saw Connor would get to about 40 degrees of torso rotation before his pelvis kicked in. That's based on the seated trunk test. Now, I'll play the video again. You'll notice as his torso rotates to 45, he's only at minus 4 degrees of pelvic rotation. Still room for improvement, but we notice that it is getting a little bit better because he's not going into that negative 10 number, and his pelvis position is not changing 1, 2 degrees, and that's really, really good. So this is our biofeedback, our training plan to help him understand how to rotate without using that lower spine. Now the second one we're going to do is pelvic side bend. Let's control that same motion with the, 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 the hip not going into that minus 13. Connor was at minus 13, actually it's minus 12.9. So during this movement pattern, we're going to allow him to turn his hips and his torso into the backswing. And at the top, I try to get him to stay, yes, right there, below that minus 10. So he's, he's less than minus 10 degrees of trail hip high. And then at impact, I gave him a target between positive 8 and 12 to go into. And he's trying to find that right there. So again, he's maintaining pelvic neutral, all right? And he's trying to get to no higher than 10 degrees at the top of his backswing and between that 8 and 12 it impacts. I could add more parameters if I want to make this more complex, like the pelvic tilt, so that as he rotates to the top of his backswing, he has to get to minus 9, but I don't want to see that pelvis arching. I keep adding parameters as I see fit, and all this is doing is taking Connor's understanding of the motion and really cementing it in his brain. So it takes this into more of a mental exercise than physical, to be honest with you but it gives us quantification and reliability at the same time. So this is just a mini example of how we take our client through that lower back pain circuit from assessment to golf swing tie-in, also known as the body swing connection, all the way into a training methodology or a rehab methodology um, to really secure it. Now, I will say this is oftentimes not replacing manual therapy, exercise, and modality. This would be a post-manual therapy, post-exercise, so that you can reassess and validate that the strategies that you use have actually worked. And again, it ties an emotional outcome for your client to the problem they're coming to see you. What's the problem again? Oh, my back hurts. But what's the real problem? I can't play golf because my back hurts. Do that, and your clients are going to have a better buy-in. All right, let's, let's look at condition number two, which is speed. So I said that, that 
one of the top two goals that people come in to see us about is, hey, I don't want to hurt anymore, and I'd like to hit the ball farther. So you're not going to get too many people come in and say, please help me hit the ball shorter. Um, I am still waiting for that person because I know how to do that as well. So speed, connecting the dots, all right, how to get faster. And two of the tests that really kind of uh, limit our ability to get faster are disassociation, the ability to disassociate the body both in the backswing and the downswing. So you'll see we have pelvic rotation test up here as well as the torso rotation test. So the, the, the goal of the pelvic rotation test is to rotate the pelvis independently of the upper body. Now you see Jesse here when he rotates, his upper body is moving all over the place along with it. Now those, those are the basic tenets of the pelvic rotation test. I also want to get into some of the finer details such as what is his bend doing and what is his side bend doing of the pelvis during that motion. Then the second test is the torso rotation test, which is uh, disassociating the upper body from the lower body and uh, ultimately what happens with the pelvis when you're doing that and what happens with the upper body as those finer points. A lot of times people say, well, the pelvis isn't moving, but what is the upper body actually doing to achieve that rotation? Is it rotating or is it going into extension and side bend? Those are some of the things we're going to look at. And then we'll take a look at the golf swing from a kinematic standpoint to determine if we're seeing better data on that via our um, strategies, our implementation, our rehab. All right, so let's start with the pelvic rotation test. So you're going to see here our parameters that we're looking at is pelvis rotation. Now, it's not a quantity test. That doesn't mean I don't care for quantity. I'm not, it's not my main goal. My main goal is can he rotate his pelvis while maintaining whatever bend he starts with. So traditionally when we bend forward into golf posture, athletic posture, the pelvis tips forward as well. So think of it as a bucket of water. The water is going to be pouring out to the front. In Jesse's case, it's pouring out about 31 degrees to the front. And you'll notice his side bend is neutral. He's neither left hip or right hip high. As we start the test, you'll notice immediately he goes into 5 degrees trail hip high. And his pelvis went from 30 to 35. So he's increased his anterior tilt to accomplish the motion. All right, maybe even 36, 37. Then he goes to the left, and we're going to see pelvis goes back to zero, plus one, left hip high, 36 degrees of bend. So Jesse's adding the additional motions of anterior tilt and side bend to accomplish a move that he doesn't want to have in the golf swing. At the moment of impact, all right, where he is right now, I certainly don't want to see the pelvis arched, all right? If it's going to move in any direction, I'd like it to see it move to a lower number. So in this test, I'm getting a lot of information on Jesse's strategy for creating speed. Now, this is the downswing maneuver. maneuver. We know that the pelvis starts the downswing, initiates, and he's going into um, massive arch when he does that. That's going to kill our ability to rotate our pelvis. If you don't believe me, I like to show people the difference between pelvic rotation test with an anteriorly tilted pelvis versus a neutral pelvis. All right, That would be a strategy that I use to give people the feeling of what it's like to rotate the lower body on top of those two different platforms. All right, The body rotation or torso rotation test is going to be a very similar con concept. We're looking at can Jesse rotate his upper body without his lower body moving. And we'll see in the motion, as he rotates, all right, the pelvis is relatively quiet. I don't have the pelvic number set up on the screen right now because I'm trying to look at his upper body bend numbers as well as his side bend numbers, all right? As you see him rotate to the top of his swing, he starts at about 45 degrees of forward bend, but then he ends up at 19. So he's kind of like Connor in the last example. He's going into extension as he rotates. The problem with that is he's putting a lot of pressure on his lumbar spine, theoretically, because of it. In the golf swing, we don't always keep the same amount of flexion as we rotate. But by the time you get to end range of rotation, your, your number should not have decreased quite so significantly in this test. An excessive side bend 
is also something I'm looking at. Now, the, the cool thing is there's no known numbers or uh, research done on this. Moving into the new, the new millennium of assessment and rehab, this is where I think our medical practitioners are going to really, really key in and give us more information on this. I'm not afraid to say I don't know what the number of side bends should be at the top, but I don't want to see it changing drastically. All right, the shoulders are going to rotate around the axis of the spine. I would contend that if we see an excessive amount of side bend on either rotation direction, we're seeing a compensation. All right, does the body side bend in the golf swing? Yes. How much is allowed in the torso rotation test? To be determined, but the good news is we can measure it. All right, so what we're looking at is just finer movement points in the torso rotation test to quantify this. All right, in the golf swing. Now, when we looked at Jesse's golf swing, this is his original kinematic sequence. All right, very interesting sequence, very, very powerful hitter, very strong golfer. Um, 428 degrees of pelvic rotation, torso is up in the mid 700s, arm speed 1100, which is pretty solid, but the hand speed is a touch low for all those first three. So is he getting the most optimal amount of translation? Probably not. And you can see that light blue line right there, which represents his arm speed. When it gets to the top, it's a little bit um, plateau-y. It kind of runs straight across. We don't see that sharp decline, which tells me he's not translating speed as effectively. Now, that's the lead arm. Could the lead arm um, have a speed issue or deceleration as a byproduct of the segments before it? Theoretically, yes. It could be a wrist release issue, yes, but the problem is he's not translating as much speed as he wants to, and that's why he came to see us. So um, in his golf swing, we have just a basic view of his golf swing, very powerful golfer, and I'm not going to traditionally, I'm not going to look at what he's doing wrong in a sequence. We know, or sorry, in his golf swing, he is looking for more speed. And so the two components that I'm going to look at are his ability to get um, good separation in his body, both in the backswing and the downswing. So let's take a second. We're going to go to B1, and we're going to look at his golf swing. Okay, let's take a look at his golf swing. So very simply put, um, Jesse's trying to get more speed. I think he's having an issue transferring or sequencing that lower body into the downswing. You see Jesse here going to the top of his backswing. Right butt is slightly behind the lines here. It's starting to migrate forward, and you'll see the initial move. It's a big thrust or early extension forward. I'm not going to talk much about plane position of the golf club. I'm just going to say oftentimes when somebody has an inability to produce the pelvic rotation into the backswing or into the downswing, they will get the forward translation of the pelvis moving in this general direction toward the golf ball versus the rotary. So I can see that left butt cheek get behind that line. That's one of the more common characteristics amongst better ball strikers. Do we see it on them all? No. But we see it on a vast majority of the best ball strikers in the world. The amount of forward translation of their pelvis is minimal. And they also can initiate the pelvis into the downswing much sooner than Jesse's doing here. All right? And the other thing that we subsequently see here, and this is a golf swing note, that the plane of the golf club gets a touch steep uh, through the transition zone. Oftentimes, with an inability to separate the pelvis, the plane gets steep. Can that take away from speed and energy? Absolutely. So these are some of the golf swing mechanics that we're seeing that are potentially limiting how much range of motion he has. So we're going to go back to our presentation and discuss a little bit more about the, the strategies that we used um, to overcome them. So with those parameters in mind, loading better into the backswing, which I would say was a basic X-factor tenant, how much more separation can you get with your upper body than your lower body? All right, some call it spine rotation in the 3D world. 
And then subsequently, how do you unload it? Jason Glass always says you've got to load to explode. Well, I'm stealing his concept. Everybody, if you do something for me, send them a note and tell them to bill me. All right, so let's look at the torso rotation at the top of the swing. This is the drill. This is our, after we do our therapy, our modalities, we're going to get into the, the, the training drill, the biofeedback. Jesse's going to go to the top of his golf swing for upper body rotation. And what he's looking to do here is control his upper body bend um, and, and more importantly, get that side bend. He's not trying to get too much backward bend. And we saw that significantly in his torso rotation test. We could also say this is reverse spine, all right? Not going into reverse spine, I should say. So Jesse's keeping his forward bend above zero. What that does is keeps his trunk somewhat flex. Is he losing flexion? Yes. He starts at 40, ends up at zero. So for every degree of body turn, he loses about, or sorry, every two degrees of body turn, he loses roughly one degree of forward flexion. That's common. That's normal. It's when we lose too much flexion, we get into extension. Take a moment to think. What muscles keep us in flexion? Abdominals. They attach the pelvis to the rib cage. If they become disengaged, and you go into extension, what happens is now you have a rubber band or a catapult system disengaged. That's speed in a nutshell. So what we're tra tra uh, training Jesse here is to maintain pelvic neutral while he's rotating his torso so that he doesn't go into arch or lumbar um, anterior tilt or lumbar extension. All those things are important because if he can rotate to that 45 degrees or more, into his backswing while keeping pelvic neutral, it's like stretching a rubber band, all right? That yields potential energy. That's what we're looking at. All right, now let's look at our second strategy. Now, once we've done our movement strategies, our therapy, we've added the rotation with neutral pelvis so that he can generate more energy. Let's add a super speed. For those who don't know, it's, it's an overweight and underweight training protocol that goes certain percentage over your normal standard weight, certain percentage under, recruits more muscle fibers, more tissue, and then allows you to swing faster, basically unlock your brain. A lot of this was adapted from sprint training. You know, many of the fastest players and sprinters in the world would run uphill, make it harder as fast as they can. They turn it right around and run downhill as fast as you can because your body is unlocking the speed and you have to learn how to control it. So Jesse in this model, he's going to go through a program after hitting balls, he's going to go a certain amount of swings with a heavy club. In this case, it'll be five swings with a heavy club as hard as he can go. So he's trying to recruit more muscle using the same premise of pelvic neutral, torso rotation, maintaining that neutral, and then unlocking the pelvis and the body through the impact zone. And what I'm trying to do is create as much speed as he possibly can. There's no outcome here. There's no golf ball whatsoever. After he implements those, he's going to then go to the light club. So this is about 10 to 15 percent lighter and he's going to be able to move his body in a much more expedient or fast manner. So his brain is learning how to run downhill right now, control all those moving parts at a much higher rate of speed. Going through this whole system, he is telling his brain it is okay to move faster, but he's telling his brain to move faster in a safe and controlled setting. All right, and then we go to the medium, which is now his club, so he can put it into a game or a game-like construct or what he's used to. And you can hear that noise he's producing. All right, he's learning how to release the club at impact, deliver the energy of the body to the golf club. We see quantifiable changes ASAP with this type of. Now at the end, he hit a very very soft object. All right, so we can get some numbers on KVS. All right, so we'll put his side-by-side -side numbers up here, and I'll pause the video for a second. Boom. You'll see his pelvis increased 50 degrees per second. His torso increased 78 degrees per second. His arm speed went 15, not the highest increase, but look how that translated into his club speed. 190, almost 200 degrees per second more speed at impact. Now, he came to us for speed. If you show a client... They're 200 degrees per second 
faster, that's almost 10%, I think if I'm doing my math right, faster, that's huge. And all that took is 15 swings. Now, it took a little therapy to get there, unlock the body, it took a little re-education on learning how to turn out of a neutral pelvis, and boom, we get those types of results. This is that harmonious relationship between why they came to see us, how to measure it, how to train for it, and most important, how to validate and report that we are seeing results so the client has an emotional tie-in. Geez, that's a lot of information. All right, our goal here is to help you understand how to grow your golf rehab program because whether it's speed or whether it's injury, they are one in the same. All right, everybody tries to hit it farther. Everybody tries to hit it faster, swing faster, but we have to do it in a safe and effective manner. All right, and most of our athletes are going to play with injuries at some point in their career. So it's a very, very important roadmap on how to build a more successful golf rehab model. This tool is valuable for us in taking our clients from point A to point B to point C. I'm very passionate about helping our medical professionals in the world get more sports specific, get into the finer points of rehab so that it takes it out of the sterile clinical setting and puts it more into that functional um, the, or, or the reason why the athlete's there setting, which is in our case golf, but this could be tennis, this could be baseball, it doesn't matter to me. It's about tying that emotional construct to our athletes. So when we're, when we're talking about growing our golf rehab program, honestly, everything boils down to communication. We have to, we have to communicate better. Elevating our communication, well, if we have better data and we have more sound data, we're able to communicate better. All right, using data-driven assessments as, a, as an intro. The, the reality is our athletes are probably smarter than we are in many aspects about the sports that they love. If we can bring a little technology into it, prove to them that it's not a guess on our part, um, they're going to be more assured that what we're doing is, is on the right track. And not to mention, it's cool. People like a little flash. They like a little zing, all right? A little bling going on there. So give it to them, and it's all in the professional setting. Connect with the golf pros. This is probably the number one thing that our medical pros need to work on is, is, is really understanding how to connect with the, with the teaching professionals. Honestly, I don't think many, most of the teaching professionals in the world are as proficient with technology of this sort as they should be. If we have medical professionals ramping up their game and becoming outfitters and providers of this service, golf pros are going to migrate to you for help. we got so many people around the world that are doing this, and they're building a stable of golf professionals that trust in them when they need the medical guidance. And then creating sessions, group packages, all that fun stuff to help make more money within your clinical setting. Those are all things that Tony's going to talk about and bring to you in a little bit more advanced setting. So please, I would say, pay attention to the final portion of this, which is going to be some examples of how these types of scenarios using K-Motion technology, data-driven analysis in a clinical setting to produce more cash-based outcomes. I want to say thanks for letting me talk a little bit about the nerd side of things, how the body relates to the golf swing. It's one of my biggest passions, and I will say this, without a shadow of doubt, I'm using it every single day at TPI. I'm using it with all my clients um, for land skill performance. It helps me understand what is happening so I don't have to guess. and effectively takes my success rate from in the 70s to well over 95%. If you think about that, if you can get a 25 to 30% bump in your success rate just using a simple validation tool, why would you not use it? I want to thank you for spending some time with me. I know time is money. I want you to go out and make some. And please, stay in touch. Cheers, everybody.